All right, last time we looked into this uh, concept of Svadhyaya as the major um, approach to knowledge in India. That's why we have Gurukulas, that's why we have memorizing the text. Memorizing the text is not only for the sake of preserving the text, which is usually understood in this way, that the tradition had to preserve the text. Yes, it is a big part of it, but also to use it as a means for, for reconnecting to the higher spirit. And this is somehow got diluted, is not very clear what it is anymore. Of course, in the, in the Brahmanic um, milieu, everybody knows about this, they know about the effect of the text which it um, creates for our consciousness. But somehow in the academic settings, it's not very clear. They think that, that the text had to be preserved and then used in the rituals and in the you know ceremonies and so on. But um, Swadhyaya is not about rituals and not about performances. It's about you reconnecting to the higher you, yeah? your higher consciousness, using the text. And I'm sure this practice is secretly going on <laughs> in the communities because it is not something to be known outside. As Taitiriya prescribes it, it has to be done secretly. Yeah. So this is the secret of India, <laughs> that the text is leading uh, the your consciousness to the higher opening. Um, why, why that part was important for etymology? Because actually there, the etymological meaning will finally reveal itself. So today I wanted to come to Sanskrit language, finally, to the roots. Uh, so if you look at the alphabet, <clears throat> I put it uh, for, of course, for people who do not read Devanagari, but still, <clears throat> you can read this. You recognize the alphabet. So you can see that there are five levels of articulation, so five sthanas, as it were, yeah. and uh, five simple vowels, a, e, ri, li, u, and finally we have uh, consonants, um, sprishtas, uh, touched ones. So if the vowels are infinite, uh, then uh, infinite because there is no stop. You know? I, U. So you you have infinite um, um, capacity to hold on to it. Uh, so the consonants are opposite. They are like dots, like sprishtas. They are touched. Yeah, ka. It happens in one moment of time. Ka, ga, gha, ma. In different modulations. I have the whole actually file which is explaining all this in Sanskrit, by the way. Here, um, the explanation of all possible sounds. Yes, it's just about phonetics. Three pages of phonetics. I created this file like 25 years back. So, um, here the explanation of the sounds are given in a very systematic way. You can see the ways of articulation, how it is given in the literature, in the Shiksha literature. So you can see that we have A, then Kavarga, then Visarjaniya, and Jihvamuliyah, that H sound, yes. So that is Jihvamula. Jihvamula is then the back of the tongue, the root of the tongue. Yeah? Yes? Yeah. Uh, so my question is this. So if it is Jifwa Muliya, it's not like normally when we do the ha, we tend to do it more urastha. We do it like ha. And Jifwa yeah. Muliya is sort of ha. It's a bit like the ha of the French or the ha of the Urdus. Yes. You know, the, the Arabic. So is it a ha? It's not a ha. It's a 
It's a ha 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 ha. Yes. Urastha. So it has quite a urastha feel to it. So how do yes. you? How does one? Yeah, you can see here there will be uh, references to this, and you will see at the end uh, with uh, the here, you see so many references, uh, differences in different uh, pratishakyas, in different uh, shikshas, how they are treating these sounds. It's quite interesting. So, they are truly speaking, they went into the, they are really splitting the hair. Don't worry, you will get your urus, yeah? <laughs> that will be there mentioned, that it is not really Jihvamuli. But Jihvamulia means, in general, the location, back tongue location. So it may be the back tongue as a place or back tongue as a location where, where the vocal cords behind. Yeah? And so if we look at the alphabet, how we articulate it, actually, this is quite interesting. Let me open the alphabet here. Mm. So you will see something um, amazing. So you can see that you have all the touched kantha. So this, uh, the jihva mulia is the jihva is articulating on the level of kantha. So they, they are kanthas, yes. So ka kha ga gha nga ha kha and a. A is also kantha because it's actually not jihva mulia, but it is in the throat so then the vocal cords hmm. sorry they also say akuha visarjaniya so that it's the kantha na kantha yes akuha kantha yes sthanam is kantha yes so uh, but uh, jihvamulia it means jihvamulam is that which which does it it is karanam they call it karanam so they really went into nitty gritties yeah that which articulates the sound on the level of kantha so that would be the back of the tongue or the mulam of the tongue uh, if you look at this system we will see interesting um, etymological kind of setup. Uh, so I have kakagaghanga and then so all the panchavargas, so to say chachajajanya, tathadadhana, tathadadhana, paphabhabhama, and then I have semivowels. So semivowels are made from vowels, as we know, yes? So if I press E to the extent it becomes touched, sprishta, then it becomes ya. Yeah? So you even if you try e, it will become y. So okay. So um, what I want to say is this: um, that if you create consonants from vowels, how would you do it? So you will have to press vowel to extend; it becomes a touch. So if I press e to the extend that it becomes a touch so to say i have to be the middle of the tongue because it is the middle of the tongue which creates chavarga cha cha ja cha nya and then i play e e is the middle of the tongue and i press it yeah it becomes ya touch so that is semi vowel now if i press press re then it becomes ra vowel yes this tathadadhana ra the ra is from re pressed if i press uh, li it becomes la yeah if i press u it becomes wa and that's why there is no distinction between wa and va between w and v which we have in english many many people from india would speak in english like uh, uh, a vast instead of vast uh, and this would be always a case for english speaking people they would hear the difference because they are trained can i share something here yes it's very interesting because the school of philosophy they will not do the dantosha they will only do the ua. so they will say weirier and so therefore my study of it is this that uh, normally it's the dantosha because there is a sound quality so if you say viria, the force of it is very different than if you say viria. Yeah. The viria is much, is much weaker than the viria is. Yeah. But the, when you have the combined sounds, like for example, Saraswati, it's much easier to say Saras 
Swati than to Saraswati. Absolutely. I don't know. That has, that's my own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the same the same observation. If you say swar, why it's swaha and not svaha, because um, because uh, and they even write W in English. Even Shir Bindu writes Saraswati with W, not V. V. It's quite interesting because it's easier to pronounce. It flows better. So the V, which is Danta or Shtia or or simply, and basically, you can see that they are actually distinguishing these two um, somewhere. There is a reference to it. Anyhow, I will send you this. You will read from different literature how they are treated, and it is treated both as uh, va, as um, as uh, w and v. You know, you hear don't don't touch them. You see, it is from Shiksha, Paninia Shiksha. So it is treating it as as dentals and labials, dental labial, not as simply labial, not wa. But there is no distinction between them as different in meaning. That's the important point. If in English w w and v are two different vowels uh, consonants which uh, which define different l l words so in uh, sanskrit they are the same yeah? there is no distinction they are in different positions pronounced differently but they mean the same thing that's what i want to say so since we got uh, went through, but if you look into how would you create a semi-vowel for a, ah, and it's quite interesting, semi-vowel for a ah, where there is no tongue, no lips, how would you create a consonant out of a ah sound? Oh, yeah. Radha is already making it here. Yeah. So, some ideas, it's written here, by the way, with question mark, you see. It's quite interesting to think about it. This awareness of the apparatus is important for our um, etymological class, etymological understanding. The awareness, how and what is happening within the mouth when we articulate sounds. That conscious effort which we make to make that articulation. We are not aware. We are speaking unconsciously, habitually. We are not how to say, paying attention what is happening within our mouth. Did you see uh, the x-ray uh, somewhere on uh, Facebook, there was an x-ray, how we articulate sounds from the side. I, you must see it. I will find this for you. Because you will be surprised what a dance, what a complex situation to articulate sound is happening within the mouth. How tongue is softly moving non-stop, how everything, how the breath, how the jaws are tense, this, this, everything. It's a living kind of jelly all the time moving when we speak. And it is quite interesting to see what happens. So how would you make consonant out of a? Ah? ah, there is nothing. There is no tongue, there is no lips, there is no nasal cave. Ah, and you have to press it to make it consonant. Yeah, I'm not out of it, since nobody says anything. No, no, I'm just saying that possibly the ha is the one that it's not a touch, but it is the constriction of the aha. Absolutely. It is the breath. We use the breath as actually that touch. Because there is no tongue to touch, palate, there is no palate, there are no lips. So there is only breath which can make that stop, that touch. Aha. Exactly that aha. That. Um, Aha, uh -huh, which is so difficult to pronounce for anybody from English also. They somehow tend to, to speak ha more than ha. 
Yeah. Maha, Maha. It's this high. It's not Maha. Maha, Aha, Maha Bharata. It's Maha Bha. It's not Bha, as usually people do. Bharata. It's Bha Bharata. It's beautiful, this ha sound, urasya, as you said, yeah? that breathing. Yeah. Just one thing, when you say ushma here, if I'm not going ahead of syllabus, sorry, there's some noise. When you're saying ushma, is that because it is the generator of heat? And that's why Absolutely, ushma, hissing sounds. Hiss. It generates this friction, their fricatives, their sibilance, their hissing sounds. It's quite interesting. And they are ushmas, ushmas creating heat. Because when the friction, when you, yeah, you create heat immediately when you just try. This is hissing sound which creates heat. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. So, um, yes, so that would be ha sound. And uh, then we have Ushmas. Ushmas are also interesting because they are creating these frictions from the touched, if the ka, cha, ta, ta, pa, touched ones. So if I s kind of break them into the sand, I will make out of them as hissing sand, as it were. Yeah. If I say ka, 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 many ka's in one flow, it will become ha sound. If I split cha into many chas, it will be sha sounds. Yeah? So it's on the same level. And the same with ta. If even ta, which is so difficult to imagine, it becomes sa, but it is ta -ta 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 if I make one sound without touch, but as if touched, yeah, close to touch. And that's what we have to look into. And put the same fa, it will be fa sound. So we have ha, sha, sha, sa, fa. My God, there is such a bad connection in with some people, poor people, they have to come in and out. Yes, Anuradha. Just one thing again. For the last one, that o and a, it's a, okay, fa. Yes. Naraf patati. Naraf patati. Yes. Fu. Visarga is called uh, Upadhmaniya. There is Jihvamulia and Upadhmaniya. Yes? So both. So that is lips Visarga. Uh, some Brahmins speak in this way. Dharma Kshetra Kuru Kshetra Samaveta Yudhama. Mamakaf Pandavas Chaiva. Mamakaf. Pandavas, Chaivak. So there will be fu instead of h. Yeah? Before pu. Pu pu, it will become fu. Association of visarga. But then the visarga and the anuswara are out of this. Anuswara is something else, yes. It's nasal sound. But even the visarga is out because that's the upadmaniya, jifamuli and upadmaniya. Yes, well, that is the name of the two types of Visarga, Visarjaniya, actually. Visarjaniya can be Jihvamuliya and Upadman. This is the, Visarga is to cast out, yeah? So Visarga, basically, that last um, breath, as it were, that sibilant at the end, which becomes the casting sibilant. So kind of closure, closure of the speech, as it were. I was thinking, why so many visargas at the end in Sanskrit words? Do you do you have any idea, Anuradha? Some other languages do not have this. Only, only of course, uh, Lithuanian has many S at the end. S, 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 S at the end. Uh, but um, I, mean, I have to just take a, just make a statement like I, I mean you have to just think aloud in terms of what sounds are what mantra is in terms of the vibrational uh, quality of the universe because if everything is vibrations at the end of the day when we end with the visarga it's as if that is it's like you know a punctuation mark for a package of sound so you're like um and ah uh, they're like two kinds of you know 
like there it's it's like closes the sound so like when you do the like shanti 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 you know like you let it just go there is no other uh, vibrational thing in it at least that's what it seems to me so you mean like a, a, a assimilation of the thing into the being or something to say so or disappearance in the being or but why that assimilation is needed, let go is needed, you know? there, there is some presumption in it that it should not stand out, it should be maybe uh, take it easy thing. <laughs> I, I, it's a big question, it's a big philosophical question, by the way, why so many visargas, why so many words ending with uh, visargas in Sanskrit? And, uh, I mean and, yeah. Sorry, no, I was just thinking that all of life, in the sense of all of the yogic experiment, the yogic endeavor, is also the the ability to let go, na? Somewhere, it is really about this let go. And in terms of sounds, like you rightly said, the sound that comes closest to letting go is the visarka. Mm -hmm. So it, um, like. I, like I think the other feature of the Sanskrit language is this the precision of its sound. So it, there is a certain rhythm about the sound. And that rhythm, if one if one practices pronouncing the sounds correctly, psychologically, what it does is that it seems to free us from our preferential behavior that we are forever into. Sanskrit is not a matter of, you know, I want to say it like that and you want to say it. it is what it is. There is a certain rhythm nature about it. And very fine, it's a very subtle fine tuning of consciousness that you have to let go of your preferences and just do that which is right and which needs to be done. Mm. And that Visarga is another, I think, the subconscious training that, you know, let go because at the end, what is there? No? Like, mm. tyak tena bundita in sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, excuse me, sir. Is it is it also uh, simulating pranayama uh, as close to uh, sarga as possible? Yeah. Well, yes. There are too many um, what you call this uh, mahapranas in Sanskrit. Yes, and um, that's why it, there was a speculation in the classical period that women should not speak Sanskrit because there are too many mahapranas. It's yeah. This is a big thing. Yes. No, no. I have to tell you this. I have to tell you this because mm -hmm. uh, I did a workshop in Philippines once, and one of my participants had just undergone an abdominal surgery. So, you know, I used to be under this impression that Sanskrit sounds, healing sounds and all. And I normally start the workshops with a, you know, with a familiarization of the vocal system and the sound. So I made them do the alphabet nice and proper. She didn't come back for the next few days, which normally doesn't happen. So I found out later on, I said, you know, what happened? Why did she not come back? She said her cousin told me that after doing the alphabet, she had the stitches on her abdomen had got injured. Oh. So there was an actual impact of those sounds. So now when I do a workshop, I always make sure that nobody has any stomach abdominal issue. Only then I tell them to do it. Otherwise you do it silently. Don't articulate them. So I know from my own experience that it is a serious matter. It's not so light. And I think that because... Oh, yeah. No, and I think that because, because the woman was the potential carrier of the child the womb needed to be protected. And for different reasons, if that womb was weak and you were instructed to pronounce these, they could damage. And because of that, possibly 1% that could damage, they made it a generalized rule because there's no way of knowing whose it can and whose it can't. So in my, just from my own experiment, experience working with these sounds, I, I can understand why they made it a simple generalization. But it, it makes an impact. It has an impact, undoubtedly. It's very powerful when you have many Mahapranas, definitely. And of course, it, it acts a kind of cleansing on the body. It, um, so to say, it stresses the whole system powerfully. And, and maybe that is where the system 
should be we should be careful of what what is happening especially when the person is pregnant because pregnancy means that there is some other body within the body which is which is not totally the part of the body and cannot be has to be treated as separate and that separation may take place too early maybe that is the explanation yeah, and, and also and also like in the veda vijnana gurukulam and all when they chant the entire vedas no so there are times when they do the vedic parayanam parayana uh, parayanam after that they have to have a special diet of ghee and you know cooling substances because of the kind of heat that that entire chanting generates so i think that uh, because the woman's body was designed to you know hold a child and uh, bear a child so it was um, possibly and and the training hours and all i think it was a it was multiple factors that resulted you know the time to be dedicated to learn the vedas to completely master it at the expense of who would do the housework because of the division of roles not for you know that the man is incapable or the woman is incapable of learning of course the Otherwise, woman is better at home with children she is much better mother than it's clear she's a better multitasker she's a better natural multitasker than a man is and yeah. possibly for various reasons yeah correct correct i so agree there are multiple factors that resulted in this you know dictum that the woman should not chant but one cannot just throw it away lightly either because there are certain truths in it which uh, can be yeah you know, definitely there are rishikas in the rigveda and and what can we uh, say you know, yeah uh, to put what uh, anuradha ji is saying uh, if you ever hear the lectures of uh, shri uh, you know swami nishchilananda who is the president sankracharya of puri puri math govardhan math Uh, he clearly says that some of the mantras are not supposed to be narrated or chanted by one who is not initiated. He says that these mantras are so powerful, so powerful that it can create some sort of mental abduction if you are not initiated. If you try to chant them without proper training, methodology, and most important, without proper rituals, these mantras are so powerful. And and he himself says that you know, uh, in my entire career, I have faced so many patients. Who come to me citing uh, psychosis or some sort of neurosis, and when I ask him that you know what was his daily routine, what was his schedule, and I figure out that he used to chant a particular mantra which he was not initiated, he was doing it the wrong way. Just that correction could actually change his life. The other way also is true that if this is not corrected, it can actually doom his life. You know, so it's not for the woman, but I think that you know some some mantras are specific needs initiation. You know, this is how they put it as. And, and and one more thing i want to add regarding what you were saying i don't know whether it is right or not why every word has a visarga after this i think that this is related with our prana this says that you know uh, you infuse the life on that particular word by putting the ha ah after the after the word or after the sound this is how they say that sanskrit is a word which is not lifeless but the every word in that uh, you know in that in this in this uh, particular language carries the life and you say that when you say that you know astihi or sta ka you just add life to it right like pranang brahma kang brahma kang brahma so this appears i think in the taittiriya upanishad kang brahma and kang brahma so you add life to it that you know it's not just the brahman but you are adding the space to it you are adding the life to it might be one of the reason i thought to share hmm Yeah, this Mahaprana, this prana, all the time. This it's very pranic language. If you notice, uh, to the extent that you actually can't speak it in very fast, many words, because each word has a sum. Yeah, you know, for example, if you take one word, bhubhrid, bhihi, bhubhrid bhihi, it's just one word with with kings. Uh, so bhubhrid bhi and you're totally exhausted there is no place to say another word so what would how would you speak such language where each word remi- uh, requires full engagement of all your breath and prana and force and so it requires a very conscious attitude uh the speech is not just jalpati something you know or uh, talking everything and anything and in one go non stop it requires uh, attention connection 
an engagement, real engagement of all consciousness and articulation. And that is something which other languages do not have. Prakrits are actually taking it easy. Yeah? And because they are taking it easy, they become what they become, whatever they are, yes, spoken languages. But Sanskrit does not take it easy. It, it keeps it as it should be. Uh, yes. And in that sense, it can have an impact, of course, on anyone. It is understand. Somebody is writing why the uh, Visnarga is... I would like to say something, Lagmir yes. and Anuradha. Uh, because I have, uh, you know, used Sanskrit when I was pregnant with my children also. And I have found it uh, very, actually, uh, nourishing. I felt uh, that it it helps also in the womb, the child, you know, hear these sounds and grow with it. And since uh, you and Anuradha have talked about this subject and, you know, you're recording this video, it will be on for probably many people to see. It might be better to... to to kind of say which sounds are not good for when the pregnant women are pregnant, because otherwise when people hear this, it might become a kind of a, oh my God, is that so? And uh, no, I don't think this is so, at, le at least not in my case. So could you please elaborate that on which sounds are not good for women who are pregnant and which sounds uh, or which chants can be used when they are pregnant, because that becomes important now. Otherwise, we will start a new dogma. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And um, yeah, it's. I, I can feel the Aurovillian spirit entering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, which is which is true, absolutely, and um, I, I believe so, and uh, that's why Rishikas were there, and um, uh, maybe people were stronger, maybe there was less uh, domination of man in the early ages, you know, uh, and this idea of sparing women only to take care of the house and um, and not to be troubled, because we can see that the shift in um, I, I will become now a little critical of what is happening within the medieval period in uh, in uh, India. You can see that the shift, the tendency is to free women from Sanskrit. Yeah? Uh, and it is not uh, a small thing. It's really everywhere. You can see it in dramas. You can see that the king speaks in Sanskrit, queen answers in Prakrit. So if you look into dramas, you will see it. And it happens in one period of time. It wasn't there in the Vedic time. And that's what we distinguish. We speak about this. Anuradha knows about this, that we promote Sanskrit to all women. We don't say that women should not speak Sanskrit. It's ridiculous, especially in this age. Yeah? We are not for that at all. We are for that, that the, the child in the womb should hear Sanskrit, should, should tune uh, himself or herself to Sanskrit sounds, all of them. So don't worry about that. Yeah? The, uh, the uh, topic is about um, Gurukulas where they are chanting non-stop texts the whole day. It's quite exhausting. And, um, and in that sense, of course, women should not do that. But to read mantra as invocation or to Swadhyaya, please do it. Uh, it's the best for the child, definitely. Of course, not severely trying to, you know, as, as uh, Japa. Japa is half voice because the, the sound of the voice is not so important. What is important, articulations are important and understanding of the text. We spoke about Swadhyaya. Swadhyaya yes. yeah, is to be done, definitely. Vladimir, also in my experience, uh, I know one person. Sorry, Anu, you wanted to say something before I... Yeah, I, I know one person who, you know, when his mother was dying and he had misunderstood, he had misunderstood the, uh, the Mrityunjaya Mantra as, you know, the cucumber falling off. So he thought it was going to be an easy death. So he chanted all night the Mrityunjaya Mantra and actually his mother survived. So this whole idea that you have to do everything correctly, correct pronunciation, correct meaning, I feel we can, you know, depend on the grace and do what we can. 
Our villain is coming back. Yes, great. Uh, I'm totally in agreement with you because uh, why the the pronunciation was so important because it's a tradition which is to preserve the text at the same time. Just one thing I wanted to say that uh, I agree with it, the fact that you know uh, there is there is that you know absolute sound is not the only criteria, but we cannot, however, deny the fact that the the web of sounds, the universe has, if you want to make it absolutely precise, it's really like a password of sound precision. So if you have that, because it's a matter of satya, getting the sound right is a matter of satya and rita. It's not so much about, you know, person. It's not neither about the culture. It is just that a sound has a vibratory effect. So if you get the sound, you will get the vibratory effect. Having said that, you can have, perf but sound is not only what comes out of the mouth. Sound is a multi-layered reality so your emotions are connected your mind is connected your body is connected if all that is messy and you make the perfect sounds it will still be hollow and on the contrary you have a perfect inside and the sounds are you know not so perfect that will be more powerful so it's the vibratory alignments that will create their impact in my understanding so the call is to keep that purity and the purity in the Ucharanam. So complete from para to Vaikhari as transparent as you can. Oh, that is because the then you transcend your individuality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, then you transcend your individuality and the Rishika had transcended their individuality. That's why they were able to hold these sounds with no aberrations on their being because their being was totally aligned. Okay, so with these words, I will take your leave. I'm sorry. I will listen to the rest on the video. As the Pita Shikshavetam, Prabham. Namaste. Okay. Great. Um, yes, it's absolutely true what Anuradha says. The, the more perfect you are in pronunciation, the, the more the, the uh, vibration is in tune with that kind of cloud. There is somewhere a cloud, you know, that's, that's a new term of all the vibrations in the highest heaven, Paramev Yoman, which, which is being uh, how to say, activate it in unison with your more perfect pronunciation, better it is uh, in unison. And consciousness in this way is uh, easier expressed. Yeah, that's what the point is. Yes, absolutely. Um, you can also speak in your language, you can pray, yes, and it will be heard, uh, definitely, if you are in a real, true, sincere aspiration, even without words. <laughs> the, the Lord knows what you need, what you aspire for. So, so that's... Uh, that's two different topics, yeah. Kind of so. so language, language as the means, as a tool for articulating higher consciousness. So Swadhyaya is not a prayer. It's notice. It's not as something you are praying or asking for. It's not your own. When ma Mother speaks about mantras, it's quite interesting. She speaks about this invocation. There are prayers which are spontaneously coming to you. And they are true in that moment of time. And they are the most active, yeah? the most efficient in that moment. Uh, that is uh, when you have a real, true, sincere aspiration in the heart, like a flame in the heart. But there are mantras, she says, which acquired a great power over thousands of years like thousands of generations of Brahmins were pronouncing that mantra. It vibrates in the subtle ether somewhere. Yeah? So once you start pronouncing it, you immediately join the power, the power which is not yours. Yes, It is the power of the mantra and of that acquisition of in time which it acquired. So everything comes to you then. You connect to that consciousness. That's how tradition works, why these mantras work. Because they are they were sounding over thousands of years in different occasions, in different contexts. And they are still there very powerfully. You can engage them to help yourself. That's how it works. So there are two different things. One is you got it, and the other is that 
traditional power of mantra which is sounding somewhere in the subtle ether and in between there are all the varieties you can imagine so if you engage your aspiration with the mantra in subtle ether it could be an amazing uh, the most powerful device and that is what i think is swadhyaya about all right so why we are looking at these Yes, there is a question which I didn't answer. Yeah, you cannot say it. Yes, uh, it is understandable why the Visarga is replaced by the sibilance, but why it is replaced by a R in some sandhis. This I can explain. It is in the in the um, historical grammar uh, because I was already mentioning. Rik Pratishakya says that. Um, a re sound, which we say, say as a re, is uh, cerebral. So we have a, e, re, li, u. Yes, five vowels. A, e, re, li, u. So a is back tongue, e is palatal, re, this r, yeah, is uh, cerebral, li is dental. We They pronounce this l, ru for some reason because they see l and the re written together most probably but it is l sound when you touch your teeth and you make vowel l and u so five vowels but in the rik pratishakya which is the oldest one 800 bc where taitiriya pratishakya this is taitiriya's scheme yes a i ri li u but in Rik Pratishakya, it is A, Ri, I, Li, U. And this is something interesting. So Ri sound is in between A and E, in between. So this Rik Pratishakya, Rik Pratishakya, belongs to the period of the, uh, of the 800 BC, most probably somewhere in the north it was articulated. Uh, composed we speak about not hearing me uh, is it am i uh, audible i am audible so um why this re i am speaking of because you see where r is it is there h, h, r, h, r. they are both in the same position guttural position uh, and so when you say Agni H, so E uh, before voiced consonant or vowel, Agni R, Atra. So if you say Agni H, Atra, it becomes Agni R, Atra. It is voiced by between two vocals. Or between uh, Agni H, Dahati, Agni, R, Dahati. Again, D is voiced, I, E voiced, and H, that H, back tongue H, is becoming voiced H, which sounds like R in Rik Pratishak. Make sense? I understood this when I taught Sanskrit to Frenchies. Frenchies always do this R at the end. <laughs> when, when I heard this H as R, I understood, ah, oh, that's how we get R, Agnir Dahati, Agnir Atra, because, because that H becomes voiced. And in the memory, it got stuck. That particular change of Visarga, uh, uh, changing into R, got stuck in the memory, and when the shift happened and the R, R became R cerebral, it was still there as a deep memory, a historic memory of change. This is something interesting. It's my own discovery. You will not read about this anywhere. There is no such explanation given in the literature. Yeah, somebody else some asking something else. No. Okay. So if you look at this alphabet, we will see the first etymological system. 
uh, we, to which I will come in detail again. But today, maybe we will look into this phonetics for for longer time, so that we will exhaust the topic once and for all, and then we will move to the roots. Um, so if I would take, uh, you could see how they are treated. It's quite interesting here. There is this abhyantara prayatna bheda. So they, the distinction between the inner effort of articulation. And you can see that ae as asprishta, all the vowels are asprishta, they are not touched. A, I, u, they are infinite sounds and some vrittach ah ah is some vrittach not opening mouth the most closed and ah is the most ativri vivrita tamach the most open sound exceedingly open so o oh, and ah o oh, and ah in between you have all the grades it's from shiksha so, and then you see really Yaralava Ishat Sprishta. So they're slightly touched. So Ri and Li are slightly touched vowel sounds. And Yaralava, semi vowels, all are slightly touched. Shasha Sa and Ha, Ushnas, what we know, and Ha is semi vowel, so to say. Ardha sprishtas considered to be not ishad but half touched, and finally panchavargaha sprishtaha. It's clear now why. It's quite clear, but this look how how they were paying attention to the slightest change, even inner effort, not only outer how it is where the tongue is, where the palate is. These are the karanas by what you articulate, then sthanas on which level you articulate, and then what effort you make is interesting. Yeah? So th that was so elaborate. And there are many interesting things here written in the comments. You will read them if you want to. If you have some questions later, maybe you please come up and we will discuss them. So here we can see with Karanas what is being articulating which sounds. So E and Chavarga and Shaya and E articulated by Jihwam Adhyam in the middle by, of the tongue. So Jihwam Ulam and Jihwam Adhyam and Jihwagram. And um, the tip of the tongue articulates uh, cerebrals and dentals. And finally, lips, Oshthadvayam uh, is articulated the pavarga yeah, and u sound. So if I look at this alphabet again, I'm coming back to alphabet, and also mixture of sounds, of simple vowel sounds, which is very important to understand, which is not understood by English-speaking people for some reason, that a, o, i, a are produced sounds. They are not original sounds. This is understood in Sanskrit. The original sounds are e, u, and the really in between, yeah, to cover the whole all five stanas. And uh, and e and o are produced sounds. We call them guna and vridhi. Yeah? Vridhi radaj aden gunaha. Panini describes them in a nice way. Sutra. He avoids R and Al, R and Al. He just says that Guna is A, A, O, and Vridhi is A, I, A, O. So when we add A to E, if I move from A, I is the first sound, if I move to E, I, you can hear that in between we have that A sound. So A sound holds. E and A, so to say, has two feet. One foot is in E, other is in A. And in between them, there is A. A is composed by A and E, where A is first. A is always first because it's vibration of vocal cords. The same with U. If I move from A to U, A. In between, I have O sound. So it is A articulated by lips, which becomes O. 
and then u. The same with e and then e. Why it is important for Sanskrit? Because all derivations are built on this system. There is always a family of e, e, i, i u, o, au. There is never a mixture between u and e family or ri and u family. Never. You will never have something like com and then came. This will never happen in Sanskrit. O belongs to U family, will never shift to E family. This is important because that creates transparent etymology in Sanskrit. Yeah? All derivations. If I take root ni, I will have netra, nayanam, nayayati. I will have all these varieties which tell me immediately that root is ni. I will never have some kind of no no yayati or uh, I will or nu or u or ri. Nothing will come. Only these sounds e a i, and that means i and i also because these r and r create a and i, and they are there inbuilt. So that transparency of the system maintains throughout Sanskrit and this is a beautiful part of Sanskrit you always can recognize the root so that's what I tell my students in Sanskrit that you don't need to remember words from the dictionary please learn the root <laughs> and the grammar how to make the derivation and you will always figure out the meaning of the word so these two, if you put together grammar and roots, you will have an understanding of how words come into being and what they really mean. It's amazing. Such a transparent, clear system. Because of these, these guna and vridhi, because of this simple system, which other languages do not have or do not value so much. They have it, yes, but they they can deviate. They can do come and came. Yeah. Make sense? So if you see any word, if I say karanam, what is the root? Kre. Kre. You know it immediately. R is nothing but vridhi from ri. It belongs to this family. If you say bhavana, what is the root? Bhu. Bhu. You know the root. Yeah. This is this is a very difficult case for English-speaking people. They will say bharut. They do not see that bhavana, bhav, bhau is actually vridi of bhu. So why this system is important? Because it allows us to create many words from one root, many varieties without deviation from the root. Yeah? Yeah, I'm speaking something very, very common sense by something which is known to us but still we never think about it how beautiful it is built and that is about etymology so if i look at this uh, the, the last thing the last drop for, for today look at this alphabet from the point of view of etymon simple root sounds and we know that um, uh, we have syllabic writing and syllabic, so to say, thinking in Sanskrit. Syllables are not this, uh, the vowels or not the letters. These are not letters. These are syllables. They are in itself, in themselves, some kind of meaningful articulations because they have consonant and vowel. Yes. So, ka, ka, ga, ga, nga, all connected with a. You see swara at the end. Kakhanga, gaghanga, ha, ha, and a are all in the same position. Kakha, gaghanga, ha, ha, a. Yeah. So, and then you have e palatal. Cha, cha, ja, ja, nya, ya, sha, and e. So, if I remove 
a and put e instead, you will have chi chi ji ji ni yi shi e. So it will be a perfect position for middle tongue. Chi chi ji ji ni yi shi. So kok ha ga 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 ha ha perfect. Chi chi ji ji ni yi shi perfect. And then I will skip to pravarga. Pu pu bu bu mu wu fu perfect. Only labials, only uh, palatals, and only gutturals. So, why I'm doing this to you now? I'm, I want to say that these are the first simple roots from which many other roots will be derived. We will see how we derive from simple root more sophisticated extended roots. Yeah? So, if you look at this chi root, chi, ji. So we have root chi and ji in use, yeah? And she we have, yeah? These are the roots we have in Sanskrit language. Chi, chinoti, chinute. Yeah? So what does it mean, chinoti? It means to pile up, to focus, to, to focus attention to one point. One pointedness of focus on one point. Piling up. Chinoti is gathering and also chi is also to think or to attend, to, to become aware of something. Yeah? From here, chit, from here, extended root with chintayati and chetati, yeah? from chit, chetana, chaitanya, consciousness, chit. Why con and even chitra, I think, from this root, which means full of of uh, uh, consciousness, so to say, or creating consciousness. So, which is later varied light and so on and so forth. Um, like Chitra is a picture in the modern language. But, um, but still, that Chi root, that attention, one-pointed attention, because E has that narrow down consciousness pointing to one trying to occupy the goal it's like an arrow flying we, we spoke about e sound then chi has that particular concentrated attention and g is another very powerful root which means to conquer and we, we do not know how to conquer to win what it really means in a way but it is that piercing and occupying, breaking through and occupying, so to say, having that piercing power to invade, invading, this is a good word, uh, and then uh, settling, which is G. That's why even they say Svargam Jayati. So how can you conquer heaven? Actually, you have to enter, you have to pierce it, yeah, and to settle there. You will see these meanings, which are contextual meanings, which we use as conquer and win, satyameva jayate, yes. Uh, so, um, but uh, it, the original meaning is that one pointed attention and powerful breaking. And she also, the root she is to sharpen. It's quite interesting, yes? Because she to lie down is also interesting. We can discuss what it is. It's always with guna, shayate, and so on. But um, um, she to sharpen is exactly that meaning which I want to, to bring here. To make it thin, to make it sharp, to make it very... Uh, one pointed. So you can see chi, g, and she. I took the simple roots from this selection uh, because I want you to feel the, how the meaning is being generated through the sound. Now, if I take pu, pu, hu, bu, bu, mu, all these level sounds, so this would be original with u, and we remember u is extended, occupying sense of existence, this kind of space, holding the space, holding the duality. Uh, then if I take pu, is, you know that pavaka and so on, uh, that uh, pu is to purify. Yeah? to cleanse. And it's interesting that psychologically pu belongs to the periphery, this, this, the last pu. If you say pu, you will feel that, that it belongs to this um, fullness where you are already at the end, at the periphery of your 
mouthfulness, as it were. <laughs> it's like you are coming to the point, you know, where uh, to the some kind of and poo. It's like um, it's quite interesting that even with pre purnam upu i u is used. Why? Because is so dominating that U is required. So, uh, and if you take Bhu and it would be, or even Pu, Pulam, uh, Pul, uh, even Sporta with S before, um, you will have that Pula, like pulling or opening, disclosing, expanding. Yeah, and uh, bhu also becoming, extending in space and time, uh, being as becoming, and mu is binding but minding two in one. You will have always this extension in space in simple roots. We have simple roots such as e to go and u root also we have as avati. Uh, with extent with uh, guna, which means we have uti, for example, yes, as a help, or uh, avati as uh, protecting. It's usually translated as protecting avatumam avatuvaktaram, yes, but it is actually extending, filling from within, and filling, and then protecting. So it's like growing within, and then while you are filled with this presence, then when you are full of it, avatuma means uh, fill me up, and that means be present constantly within me. Yes, make me full of your presence, and that means protect me. So I think protection is a secondary meaning, which is contextual, yeah? whereas feeling and being present within is the major meaning. So this. What, what, what was the root of avatu? Yeah, av. We find it in the dictionary as av, but I say that av is a guna of u. Yeah? Simply, simple root u. It's the same as e, e t from e. No, it's a guna from E. Oh. So we have simple roots E, U, and Ri. We have Ri simple root. We don't have Li simple root and A simple root. There is no A root. And there is a reason for it. Yeah? We will look into that reason why there is no A root. Because I is engaged in building up many words, especially guna, like avatu, avati, yeah? and so on. You have many roots starting with a. If you look into the into the dhatupatha, you will find many roots with a starting, but they are all assigned a very general significance, like moving, atati, yes, and so on. We have to look into these simple vowels and how they create meanings. So, this is the first etymological simple system. If you start examining it with extended roots uh, and also mixing the vowels, if I start mixing the vowels like E plus U will give U, yeah? uh, E is moving, one pointedness, focus. Uh, and U is duality, and I will get U as a device holding two in one, uniting and uh, also dividing because one can be seen as two. So we have the root uh, V uh, or uh, V as prefix, where we have Vishnu. Vishnu, Snu is the suffix of the doer, and V is the root. So Taitiri Aranyaka describes Vishnu as the one who holds heaven and earth together. So it's quite interesting that you will see that that etymological significance is in building the root, Ui, yes, duality in one, holding one, two in one, 
and that is Vishnu. We are trying to go deeper into the meaning or in significance, into the significance of the sound. That's why we kind of deconstruct the words. Yeah? So it should not be mm, taken with offense. It's we are just trying to dive deeper into the meaning how, what sound could mean, why these roots mean what they mean. So, and you, you can see that you extended with j or you with d. These extensions, they add a particular unique application, as it were. They are not dominating the you meaning, the you is the major meaning, but j, d, yud, yudhyati, or yuj, uh, yunakti, seventh class, and so on. You will see that uh, they add a particular flavor which could add a new meaning as it were or a new application you know? so yud is to fight where two opposites are held in one space you know? uh, again you is visible the meaning of you is still there the same with huge to yoke yeah to use uh, to unite, you see in English they are all starting with the U in the sound even. It's weird because it's in the European language and so cannot deviate far away from Brihaspati's speech. So the the sound is still dominating the creation of the meaning. Yeah. Whatever way you write it, yeah, you may write it uh, however you want, but uh, but the sound will be still there. Okay, I will stop here and next time we will look into the systematic, how roots are being distributed, the meanings are distributed through this etymological system. I want to say one thing, that this alphabet is the basic etymological system of all possible articulatory devices which have meaning. Yeah? They are not just, this is not just the alphabet. These are the system of, like Mendeleev's system of chemical tables. Yeah? Chemical tables are distributed, you find it in this position, you know what it means, how many electrons, how many protons, here the same way. So it has a meaning, yeah? because that particular uh, position in the system of articulatory uh, devices it creates the meaning generates a particularly unique significance which when applied and used creates contextual meanings which we know as meanings okay here i will stop if you have some burning question you may ask uh, because i'm already 15 minutes over or 16 already Okay, great. I will close with mantra. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santo Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschit Dukha Bhag Bhavet Om Shanti 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 Shri Guru Bhyona Maha Hari Om Hari Om Namaste Hari Om